No. Uh, we're going to do the report outs of these uh, that breakout section. We're going to do that first. Okay. And then she's she's doing. Uh, we are adding a little something in here. Yes. I don't need this in California. What's that? <laughs> Difficulty joining. Rejoin. So, uh, uh, currently, uh, I mean, the next month, I uh, try to organize one workshop for reference architecture of a smart city. Okay. And then, actually, I invited Josh because of the three, uh, Skira. Uh, yeah, Skira. Mm -hmm. And there was a part okay. related of the espresso. Yeah, yeah. But Joshua, maybe he said, maybe there is some event of the, uh, the pilot. So oh, if next you, month. Yeah. January. Yes, there is a major no, January. January. Yeah. yeah, next January. Maybe if Josh cannot attend it, could you attend? Maybe. Yeah, January 13 and 14. Maybe. So after I, I will you know, get the, the response, then okay. I will send yeah, it. Yeah, 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 let's see. To you let's see. If yeah, yeah, yeah. Just yeah. Send me some information. Okay. Yeah. And, and do you uh, have some connection to uh, ISOTC two uh, two six eight? 
It's uh, smart city. Yes, I can do that. I can do that. Yep. Then could you give me some? Yep. Send me an email, email. Remind me. Yeah. I will do that. Then okay. and I will yeah also invite you someone. Sounds good. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right, let's go ahead and start reconvening. And the first order of business is to have some report outs from our various working groups. I totally failed to make reconnection. So, um, Do you want me to try that? Yeah, sure. I don't know exactly. Uh, it's, it's a neat. I'm not on there, but it shows, yeah, it shows like it's running. So... Um, Let's see, who is already here in force that uh, would want to, looks like most of the DNI folks are here. Mark is our reporter. Yeah, we don't oh, okay. yeah. else else we just talk. Yeah, it's a little a little VGA whenever here. <laughs> but the VGA or is that Apple? You know, just want to talk to him? I think it's there we go. We got all these starring all these stern sure? devices. No. Just talk to that train. Okay. Mm -hmm. Don't worry about that. All right, so uh, when uh, during the discussion of of this topic, uh, at some point, Mark uh, was kept talking about DNI, DNI, and I thought, okay, DNI, got it, bit narrow, but fine, DNI. But he is actually meant D and I, so uh, defense and intelligence. And so in the breakout group, um, one thing that was clear is we it, it's good to start with a good definition, right? Students love it and professionals love it too, because you can build on some solid foundations. And so offered up was uh, data science, the art and craft of people making value out of technology and data. Uh, and um, that's, it's pragmatic, it's workable, it's suitably fuzzy and warm, you know, art uh, and craft. <laughs> oh, yeah, we, we can go to the, to the Saturday market with the to the fair and um but i think i think it, it captures well that it is about it is about technology right if you don't know anything about technology you probably can do data science but if you don't know anything about the domain in which you're operating uh or about the people that will be operating in the domain including yourself um then you can't do data science either and one of the most common complaints for example about data scientists coming out of academia is that they know how to code and throw data together, but they don't know why, to what end, for what purpose, especially in the business world. Uh, but it's also probably true in the non-business governmental world. Um, so, so that's the art and craft of people making value out of technology and data. Uh, so then we had four common themes. One was to maybe a need to redefine, re-understand the concept of a map. Uh, what mapping means, what artifacts would qualify as a map, and what are some new challenges in that. Um, where ultimately it comes down to the purpose, whether we call it a map or a mapping effort, uh, the purpose is to get the right information to the right person uh, at the right moment in time. And so with that, each of those right information, right person, right time, uh, has particular challenges. Um, and one thing we can see there is really that there is a conundrum of operating in multiple spaces simultaneously. So we all operate, obviously, in this domain, we think predominantly at first about geographic space, physical space. 
But when th and that's the space in which, and we talked a lot about uncertainty, how we convey it, how we measure it, uh, how people can understand it, how users can understand it. But mostly we've gotten pretty good at doing that in the, in the physical space, in geographic space, positional accuracy, in other words, uh, that we can draw ellipses on a map. Uh, maybe with uh, it's an ellipse, right? So it has some variation, <laughs> two dimensions, and and to then we pray that uh, decision makers understand what that means. Uh, though more often than not, they might ask uh, the analyst or who sits between the analyst and the decision maker. Uh, okay, fifty percent chance, 60, 70, 80, 10 percent. So um, so there's the question of how do we actually communicate that? But even beyond that, as I said, we operate mostly. In, in uncertainty communication in the physical space domain. However, when things go wrong, it tends to be in other spaces, namely attribute space. That, for example, the right building, let's say, is targeted and the, and the missile is, is, the targeting is extremely precise. It just happens to be the wrong type of building <laughs> that was hit. And that's, that's an error in attribute space, right? When, say, an... An, an embassy is uh, is hit of a foreign country uh, as opposed to the intended target, as happened in uh, was it Belgrade, right? Um, but there are other spaces when things go wrong, like if we misunderstand or don't even know structures in knowledge space, um, like for example um, uh, uh, ideological directions that we don't even know about uh, when people you know confuse, let's say the the written text of, uh, of a particular religion is understood and highlighted from all kinds of ways, but the oral tradition might not be as well understood, which actually drives uh, uh, new ideologies. Uh, and so there's all kinds of spaces in which we have to organize them ourselves and then communicate to decision makers where we are and where we want to go in all of these different spaces. And it's not just physical space, it's also attribute, uh, knowledge and network space. Um, then there was a warning, a warning sign to step back from the technology, zoom out and understand the, uh, the application domains, uh, the, the tradecraft and the workflows. And the question was asked, how can we support that better? Um, uh, whether it is training up um, domain experts in the technical side uh, or getting more exposure to the technical experts with respect to tradecraft and domain knowledge. Um, and, and generally, uh, the way I would always refer to it is that it's oiling the knowledge ecosystem of the geospatial domain. Uh, and the question is how well oiled that ecosystem is, how easy it is, it, is it, for example, for an analyst at NGA to match a particular task against the set of hundreds of tools in, say, ArcGIS, um, because you cannot know, know all of them, but you have to quickly find the right tool. Um, so there's a lot of knowledge transfer needs uh, from experienced operators that, however, are not up to speed on say, data science approaches to uh, recent graduates who, can, who know TensorFlow, and that's their hammer for every nail. Um, so the, I think a big theme was over, overall enabling the workforce. Uh, I don't know that we had answers. Oh, yes, there were some answers as to... Um, um, so now I try to remember. This was before lunch. This is, <laughs> you know, it just, to me, every day is BL and, and, and PL, before lunch and post-lunch. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, so um, it was about uh, small steps, basically. I would I would translate it as so. If someone uses Excel now, right? There's nothing wrong with that. It's important to build on that. Just to uh, to say, okay, you have Excel. Okay, how organized? How well organized is that? If you're looking at your existing Excel table that represents this situation. Does it actually make sense to you? How would you improve it if you now really think about it and step back? Okay, now beyond that, the, the example was, was used, okay, once people get excited about even working with boring Excel tables, they pick up somewhere, I heard about this Python thing. Can I do something with that? Yes. 
go forth and marry the two, marry what you already know with these new tools. And, and if it leads up to something useful being done using TensorFlow, so be it. Um, but if it's a simple regression, um, so be it. And perhaps it'd probably be the first choice. Um, so that's what I had. Uh, that was DNI. Uh, who's next? We actually had an interesting thing happen on the way to the bay uh, in the walk of the insurance group. It became the insurance and health group in some ways. So, uh, uh, <laughs> so uh, insurance first, perhaps. Uh, you Ting and Ben Tuttle. Oh, there's an E on the end of Tuttle. But uh, if, uh, you guys want to, I don't know if Ben's in the room or not. Go ahead and tell us what you two talked about. Here, let's, let's just do that. Um, yes, we just uh, exchange ideas of the, you know, business, um, you know, Ben, Ben's company, my company is doing, and I think um, later on, um, I think uh, we, we have people from the health uh, as well, they're doing research. Uh, so we talked about uh, the data, um, you know, how the, you know, the satellite imagery, for example, uh, is helping the insurance industry. You know, a lot of, um, for example, the use case is underwriting, right? So uh, a lot of underwriters, um, so they want to know the truth of the uh, property casualty insurance. They want to know, um, you know, what the property is like, you know, what is the condition of the roof, for example. Um, and there are these, uh, you know, uh, new generation insurance companies uh, like Kipo, right? So when you apply for uh, insurance policy, you know, when you enter your address, you know, the policy form, a lot of information will be pre-populated and all this information is, you know, retrieved from somewhere. So that's the data behind the scene where, you know, it's you know, a lot of these um, imagery based assessments. Um, and another use case in insurance is you know, in uh, catastrophe um, event response. So I think there, there have been uh, talks about uh, disaster management, uh, disaster analysis, but then there's also, you know, for, for those kind of events, there's the insurance perspective of it. Um, so when the hurricane, you know, came in, right, insurance companies would like to know um, where to allocate their claim adjusters. And they want to have a, you know, rough sense of, you know, how much damage will I have to uh, put up with this, like in this event. So depending on the path of the hurricane, um, and uh, wildfire is another example, right? Like, yeah. you know, insurance companies want to know, you know, how much damage am I up to? You know, can I sleep at night? So those kind of questions. So for uh, disasters from an insurance perspective. Um, so my background, like uh, my previous job was with a, a catastrophe modeling company. So I know like for the modeling piece as well, for each peril, like flood, uh, hurricane, earthquake, you know, like there's a lot of geospatial uh, application there, especially right now, flood modeling is very hot in the modeling world. And that requires a very high level of accuracy in terms of, because, you know, it matters a lot for just a few meters uh, for the water damage. Um, so that's, a, you know, another very, um, uh, another application area where geospatial you know, data and, you know, the advancements in geospatial uh, science, uh, you know, uh, has a big impact. Um, so some other areas, I think, uh, I'll just share some of my um, experience or like what I heard in the insurance industry. Um, so for traditional actuarial modeling, for example, to price insurance policies, um, there's the uh, spatial smoothing. Just think about it for your homeowner's insurance or auto insurance. If you're from neighboring zip code, you don't want to see your price to be dramatically different. So even though, you know, like running through some other, you know, GLM models or things like that, um, you might get some um, big differential in the price. But after that, you know, you can't just take the model output as is. Then you look at these kind of things. You, know, you need to do some run through additional like smoothing algorithm to make sure, you know, you that people can't, uh, you don't want people to take advantage of those uh, gaps. 
to uh, avoid uh, adverse selection. Um, and so ge I just find in general, like in insurance industry, geospatial um, applications, it's just see a lot more on the up, uptrend. People find more and more um, like really helpful insights from location intelligence, basically. Yeah. Um, so another, sorry, I just thought about this. Um, so when you have a location, right, like, uh, for insurance, you also want to know for earthquake risk, for example, you want to know the soil type. Um, for hurricane, you want to know, you know, distance to coast, um, those kind of things. So it's all very location based. Mm -hmm. um, so with all the uh, information, you know, uh, from the imagery and from, um, you know, modeling companies, you know, all this information gets enriched to that location, and that will tell underwriting a lot about, you know, what's about this risk. Yeah. That's good. Appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. <laughs> and health discussion. Jay. Uh, hi, it's Jay from UC San Diego. And uh, we had a really good conversation you know, with uh, George and Benjamin on the walk to the, to the bay. And I think uh, one field that is not being addressed so far in the location power uh, uh, yesterday and today is about the crossover between geospatial technology, data science, and health. And what we're doing and what we're seeing a lot uh, is, is going two directions right now. One direction is going to population level, nation level, international level, uh, groups utilizing satellite imagery and um, sensor uh, survey data, trying to understand uh, neighborhood characteristic and the risk factors that directly impact certain health um, or certain disease outbreaks. That's towards that direction. There's a lot of work there. Uh, from satellite imagery for developing or not really developing countries, you they don't have enough uh, ground power or uh, data collection. So ut utilizing that, you can understand. For example, um, we do see projects um, identifying the slumps, a different type of slumps, and in Mumbai, and how uh, to come up with a, a plan when there's a disease outbreak. So there's a project that's a project going on with Super Computing Center at UC San Diego. And what my personal projects touch more on is utilizing patient level individual data uh, with uh, participants or patients that wear sensors and we understand their daily exposure to environment, what type of uh, environment, um, whether it's physical environment um, or uh, nature environment, including air quality, noise, and how does that uh, impact their health outcome? And we're working on a lot of um, uh, eating uh, predictions, so using geo AI technology, trying to understand the moment of eating. So uh, with heart failure patients, it's very important when they're eating, when we can identify um, a high propensity of eating, we can suggest nearby healthier options. Um, so that's one of the power of geo AI with location, time, and understanding the person's behavior. So I think this, there's a lot of uncertainty there, but there's a lot of opportunity, and this is uh, what we're working on in a precision medicine field, trying to come up with customized individual treatment plan that works for everyone and their specific condition. So I think health, uh, there's a lot of opportunity. There are people start working on public health, uh, is already recognized the impact on environmental um, on health outcome. And they're catching up the field and they need a lot of um, geospatial knowledge and technology help in the field. So, uh, so I was talking with George that uh, we can get helps into one of the domain of, of OGC's future direction, and uh, maybe a lot of co collaboration can, can and Ajay also mentioned that uh, the company's work on that. So um, yeah, that's pretty well, much. Very good, yeah, yeah, it's up. very timely, because next week we will, AJ will start the health uh, domain working group. So uh, the use cases we spoke about are really uh, very relevant to where we go with that group, so. It's population level and uh, precision level. Precision so level, yeah. 1015 in France. So yeah, put us on the list. Put us on the list. Thank you. Uh, next is transportation. And, and. All right. We had a robust discussion and a, a great group. We uh, quickly honed in on HD maps, uh, and it was a focus of our conversation there. And we started the conversation about the difference between uh, machine learning and machines actually 
uh, pulling the data or generating the data with uh, autonomous vehicles and how we need to think about that a little differently. And that led into a conversation about uh, the HD maps, uh, a mapping system. We might need to rethink what a mapping system is for uh, these HD maps uh, and all the different layers that, that are in there. So it's really a, a, a new approach. We, we quickly realize that there's both technical and policy issues that need to be addressed. And we really want to figure out how to make a standard or a spec uh, last over time and need to address some of the high-end issues, high-order issues, before we can get, get to some of the technical issues. Uh, a lot of the questions were, oh, who, who, what happens if there's a crash? Uh, who's liable? Is it the OEM? Is it the a map maker? Is it the city? Uh, and uh, who, who owns the map? Uh, so a lot of discussion on, on that and how, where, how that um, fits together there. Assuming that there is some type of entity that collects this and we, we, we develop a, a standard, there was uh, the recognition that the this space is different than some other transportation spaces like aviation where uh, airlines don't compete on safety where, you know, in the surface transportation space, people do compete on, on safety. And so how do you protect that IP uh, while still giving some of the base data to uh, an open, common uh, repository? Uh, and so really thinking about what that, what that looks like, uh, how that gets done, how that gets done in a production environment and you don't have copies of this all over the place. Uh, Kind of the, the the structure of that, um, and then we we heard a, a couple different examples. We talked about Singapore and what goes on there, and then right here locally, LA with their uh, shared mobility standard and what's happening there, and uh, very exciting uh, approach there. And uh, how they've not only established the standard but also a nonprofit to deal with some of the issues around that. So we're thinking about what, what an MVP might look like for this and, and a, what, what our next steps could be in, in this conversation. So recognizing this is different types of, uh, this different type of data, different uh, approach, uh, really want to look for that, that consistency between the providers of the data uh, as we, we go forward. And then hook up with the, the geo community a little bit more, uh, probably do a, a gap analysis and really play off of what we're seeing in LA as a, a starting point for a standard and um, build out from there. Cool. Thank you. Ed. Uh, I see you're looking at notes. If you want to share those, we'd be really happy to get them. Absolutely. <laughs> send them. I got the DNI. If anybody else has notes as we go around, send them to me. Uh, natural resources and agriculture. Who wants to raise their hand for that one? Don't make Regan speak again. <laughs> I'm walking towards you until you point to somebody. <laughs> I will start, but then whatever I forget, somebody else has to uh, chip in. Um, so we talked a lot, I'm trying to remember now, but we talked a lot about um, one trust and what does it take to make sure the analysis, uh, the analyses you're doing um, get uptake um, by folks and what some of the issues are there. Uh, you know, the idea of going in as a data scientist with the answers, we, the kind of collective experience was often that was really counterproductive and a good way to make sure that nothing you do serves any value in the world um, because people come with their own perspectives and they want, they want to understand what you're doing and they want their voice to be heard. Um, and so that's that's a, a important component of the process. Along those lines too, we um, explored that issue that we started exploring as a group of that human component. Um, and how do you build that into processes? Um, what, what kind of information you get and what situations do modeling approaches work and how do you know when they're not and are you able to, to address that? Um, so that, that was another topic of conversation. Um, what else did we touch on? Um, some of the the bigger challenges in um, you know doing running various models, but not necessarily understanding what the drivers are and whether data science can help you identify those, or if 
that can kind of mislead you in different directions if you you're not measuring the right things um, and learn some really interesting stuff about how things are, are measured on agricultural mm -hmm. lands and uh, come, some of those data sources. Uh, we also had a, a conversation about data sharing and um, kind of what what's out there being collected and how people do or don't have access to it, um, what scales data is, um, what scale we should be operating at and how important scale is or, or isn't, you know, is it always the best to try to get the most precise information and make inference based on that? Or is that both, you know, unnecessarily unnecessary and inefficient and sometimes gives you the, the wrong types of answers? Um, so that was conversation. What else did I miss? Anyone who would see the people in my group? <laughs> All right, well, well, that's some of it at least. Cool, uh, Lance, for the data sharing and ethics. We had a great walk. Uh, uh, okay, um, yes. So I, I'm going to look to uh, some of the people who were with me because we, inevitably, I think, strung out into uh, two or three groups, so I may not have got everything here. So we discussed kind of data sharing and, uh, and ethics as we, uh, as we went in, in different parts. So there was a, a general feeling that, uh, of course, data sharing is to be um, encouraged, that uh, maybe on the kind of EO, kind of Earth observational mass collection side, there is possibly some thinking that it's um, the difficulty there is in actually acquiring things like so ground truth or reference data that goes with the uh, EO and how to encourage sharing of, of that. And particularly, there's a point about there's been a history from agencies like ESA of funding projects over years and actually trying to dig back and find previous, um, say, ground truth sets from previous uh, studies is is um, not so easy and, and what, what might be done about, say, repositories of, of that sort of information. Um, there were different, certainly different models amongst the uh, groups uh, with us about how the um, data sharing is uh, supported and paid for. Of course, put data out there and to, to support its sharing is, is not a, a cost-free um, activity per se. Um, and then in some, in some groups, there's uh, thinking about how to build in data ethics in at the start with the, the data sharing and uh, making decisions a bit more particularly about what might be personally revealing data that's being shared and how to handle an, or anonymize that, that sort of thing. Um, an interesting discussion evolved around what is actually personally identifiable information and how you identify that. And, for example, these days, if you were starting from scratch with uh, telephone systems, would you be able to uh, publish a phone book um, anymore with a list of names and uh, names, addresses, and phone numbers, and uh, all the rest of it? Um, and then also um, aspects of, uh, of bias as well, both on the sharing and the ethics uh, side um, there about either handling it in intentional data collection and um, yeah, going back to some of the things that came out from the uh, panel speakers of of understanding bias in the um, in the data and how you how you assess that, particularly where you don't know the whole population, so it's difficult to know whether your sample is is biased in that case. But also on a flip side, of there are some sources that just will be inherently biased, like if you're trying to extract stuff from Twitter, yeah, you know, there is no not biasing uh, sort of way of sampling from that. So then it's a more of a matter of understanding what the bias is and ans asking the right questions from that and being ethical about actually kind of asking the right questions and also in that space understanding what you have permission to do really with that that data not in the legal sense but in the ethical sense of what are people expecting to be done with that that information is part of that uh, that ethics as well so i'm not sure we came to any grand conclusions about um, how to solve those things but at least we described a bit of a, a problem space any others uh, who were on that walk? Have I missed any topics in, in that? Take silence and no. The okay. bay was the yeah. grand conclusion. Reaching yeah. the bay was Yes, it was perfect conclusion. timing. It was 20 minutes out to the end. We saw the vista and 20 minutes back. So it was, there you it was go. perfect. Yeah. Very good. Thank you. Let's thank all the folks and work. So now we're uh, done with session four. We're moving to session five. AJ goes, oh, man. <laughs> and uh, the chair of um, session five is Navy.
I like that one. That one was new fancy machine. <laughs> oh. While we're waiting, check out my laptop, my sticker. <laughs> They're brand new. I'm so proud. <laughs> Are we in? Mm, I would have thought that would have been enough. Should be enough. There, there's two. Is that the, Maybe it's a different one. I'm going to try the other side. Maybe there's a difference between the sides. No. Something is happening. No, it was somebody Do you have joining, to I think. Uh, is there another? This is all USB C. Huh? Should you I get USB C? Yeah, you should be fine. Yeah, yeah that's what so I would have thought. Yeah. I'm hearing something. Mm. There's mm -hmm. two over two one over there and two over here. Because mm, I can't get enough. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's become a ubiquitous connector, is what it is. But, uh, it's not working. There's some. It's okay. It's all right. No, I, should I stop sharing? You should right? stop. Oh, so can I do that from here? Or should I can do it from here. Still not seeing you. Oh. All right. You can. Can you put the link from Adam, the app with the questions, and share it? That's all I want. It's just if he shares this on app. Okay. Thank you. Actually, you got you. Were you on the meet? I was. No camera, no sound. All right. Thank you. All right. all right, so now that we went through all this trouble, you have to work with me here. So this is the last uh, session of the day before the wrap up. Are you excited? Yes. <laughs> um, so this session is all about actions. So um, essentially, what do we each one of us take out of these last two days? and go back to our real lives and what do we do differently? What do we you know, try to interject into our daily jobs out of these two days? Um, so a couple of things to keep in mind. One is, um, you know, actually Adam set up this page with, uh, which allows you to post questions um, that the panelists and the keynote speakers can answer. Uh, you can even vote. So we have actually some questions up there. So if you like a question, just vote on it. So because there are many, <laughs> and I think this would be one of the leftovers of this workshop, of this summit, we're not going to be able to answer all the questions. So this is at least would give us the priorities of the people in the room. Uh, so please, you know, check it out and vote. I think the panelists will, would appreciate it. And the other thing before I introduce the two uh, presentations is, again, this is about actions. So as you listen to the presentations and to our panelists, think about what we can do to uh, bridge data science and traditional GIS, you know, both ways. What skill sets will be required? How do we train people? How do we train data scientists? Um, how do we help organizations automate and scale geospatial data so that it is 
you know, usable in uh, workflows that involve artificial intelligence and machine learning and data science. Uh, what actions uh, could OGC do uh, to help with this? And uh, any other suggestions for the future? So keep, it's a lot of questions, keep those in mind as you listen. So with that in mind, uh, I'll present my, you know, first speaker. I'm looking at George because we're totally off time. So I don't know, like, you know, you keep us honest, I think. <laughs> So our, our first uh, speaker on the actions, again, so we're going to start doing things here, is uh, Dr. Satoshi Sagikushi. And he is the VP of the National Institute of Advanced Industrial Science and Technology, or AIST, uh, in Japan. And his team is constructing the world's largest AI-focused open public computing infrastructure and they call it ABCI, and he is going to tell us all about it. All yours. Okay, thank you. Do you need this? Yes, otherwise I have nothing to present. <laughs> all right, oh. switch back to me. Here, okay. So by the way, how many minutes? Originally, I was assigned 45 minutes, so yeah, I'll, I'll go back. Oh, no. I'm sorry. I'm, no, no, it's okay. I will try to catch up here. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Oops. And let me check. Wait, 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 wait. And freeze. Oops. Wrong. Okay. Uh, okay, good afternoon. So thank you for having me in this uh, uh, very exciting uh, workshop today, so in particular for George. So, <laughs> so well, um, in the listening the uh, the discussion the, the, the from yesterday and today so the uh, i'm feeling a little bit nervous about that because so the i'm a right person to speak about this kind of an topics and that is because uh, the uh, i haven't been uh, well the i used to attend the the, the ogc meeting in uh, well yeah, around 10 years ago but the uh, last 10 years so the i'm a little bit here uh, staying uh, a little bit far from the uh, uh, OGC activity. So, yeah, more like doing the uh, uh, management stuff rather than doing the real research. So, that's why. And then the, today, my talk there will be the, something like this way. So, the, uh, well, as I mentioned, the, well, 10 years ago, the, the actually at the uh, AIST, the, my team, they started the, uh, the so-called GeoGrid project, so which is intended to uh, offer. Well, the the actually the at that time, so the year of two or four or five, so the, the even the Google Earth is uh, not being in a public space. So that the, uh, the we used to have a, a, in the AIST, we have a. We have a, a satellite imagery data set from the uh, Aster the sensors, but the, uh, those data are well, archived as on a tape. So that the, if you need to access some part of the uh, uh, such an allocation data or imagery data, but you have to wait at least in one week to uh, get the, uh, uh, the such an image in the, from the archive. So, oh, okay. So the I, or my team, the, the coming from the, uh, the IT side, the uh, sitting in the, somewhere between the uh, satellite imagery data group and then the, the application in the group so that the, uh, we can offer uh, more uh, the advanced in the IT technology to bridge the gap. So uh, the first thing we did was to uh, archive, uh, well, to bring all the data into the disk space so that we can access 
such an data instantly. So that was the uh, our original idea of the geogrid. And then they're still doing a lot of the, the application on top of uh, this and our infrastructure. So the uh, yeah, actually at that time, so AST or the uh, uh, open grid forum, they got a sponsor member and then as well as the founding members. And also the uh, uh, the member of OGC associate members since the year 2007. So that the, uh, we uh, used to work very closely. So the uh, briefly mentioned that in the Aster is uh, the, at that time actually, the 10 years ago, 12 years ago, so that was our main contents of the uh, uh, our geogrid. So it's an optical sensors, and then well, they, they're covering most of the uh, uh, the, uh, the land space, and then the providing the very good the the maps the out of uh, such in the sensor data, and they're still the active. Uh, they actually the, their nominal lifetime the. Well, and the, the the satellite launched in the uh, year of 2000, and then they're still working and they're very healthy. And then the, uh, for example, using the such a the satellite, well, the Astra data, so which is the the flying over uh, the the Earth, and then the revisit the period is about around two weeks. So that the uh, we take uh, the uh, the picture and to find out uh, the kind of the time series uh, the changes of the uh, the same uh, location. So yeah, for example, actually this is the case of the uh, the, the Bangkok new uh, airport. So uh, the we taking the pictures since the uh, year of two thousand till the uh, uh, two oh six. So that we can find the great changes how uh, such a big airport has been developed, and then the, we can find in the similar uh, the changes in so many places, and then the also uh, the well the, we uh, not only we uh, just in the uh, move the data from the tape to disk, but also uh, the we are thinking the how to uh, given a service to. You know, for the uh, for the users, but the uh, well, we decided to use the the OGC standard service uh, to uh, well to capture the part of the uh, such an data, and then also uh, the if possible, so such an data can be processed in uh, in uh, the remote computing uh, services. So that the well, actually, even at that time, the not only just in the handling such an imagery data, but also the we are thinking the how to deal with such so huge amount of the data in a, by using the uh, uh, that large scale of the computer system. And then, well, this is the, the one of the example of the uh, workflow of uh, the planning and the mitigation of the from the disaster. Well, uh, this is the the the, the, uh, the, the uh, top left. So there are the uh, geo uh, data, well geology data, uh, which the also uh, are part of the our AIST uh, mission. But the, uh, they are uh, the surveying the geology in a country, and they also use as uh, satellite imagery data from the Aster. They may create a kind of data elevation model. And then they, well, and they also the in situ data. So all combined together, and then they are using the uh, big computing system and the, to uh, simulate the well a sort of a lava flow or some other uh, the disaster uh, well uh, as short as possible. And then creating a kind of a hazard map. And also uh, this is a case of the landslide. So the again the taking the uh, geological data as well as the uh, uh, meteorology data, and then the also uh, the data elevation model, and then the creating the uh, uh, landslide, uh, the, 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 the simulation model, and then they gather the gather all data, and then to predict you know, what will happen in the next you know, one week or something. 
So that the, uh, yeah, we had a lot of the study the, even uh, 12 years ago, and then the uh, identified the sort of the architecture uh, for making them happen. So I will, I will come back on this slide later, but uh, this structure is about uh, the, uh, uh, it's still the viable. I mean, the, from, from the bottom, so there are the resource layer, and then the, the, for the computing facility and data storage facility, and then also the, we can access to the uh, internet data. And also uh, the, for or the managing such a data, we have to consider uh, the security issues and how to communicate such a data to each other, and then the, how to give the authentication and the authorization of uh, such an each part of the data. And then this, there are several layers the, from the system layers up to the uh, uh, the application layers. So there are the, yeah, several the opportunities for the having uh, the, the kind of the the platform uh, for uh, uh, offering the, uh, the data that data access service or workflow uh, engine services and etc. So that's a kind of the uh, the template. In, uh, for all uh, our uh, geo and the services. So a uh, little bit the uh, different topics I'm going to talk about, the, uh, which is the in Japan, the government is still, uh, government is strongly pushing on artificial intelligence and it's R&D. So uh, the, in the past couple of years, the Japanese government is strongly promoting the Society 5.0 and then the, which the, even the scientists are investigating the uh, Society 5.0. So, well, this is actually, well, the uh, kind of digitizing uh, the whole the society. So that the, uh, uh, not only to making the application into the, each silo, but the, they, the, we wanted to set up the sort of the platform the, where uh, we can the, the, the create the, the application on top of it. So that the, the making the uh, Society 5.0 happen, the, of course, an artificial intelligence is a uh, uh, key technology. So the, but the, indeed the AI, so you might be familiar with that the, uh, we used to have the uh, artificial intelligence boom, so several times, and then the, well, first one actually back in the 90, 1960s or sometime around, but the second big wave was actually in the middle of the 80s. So at that time, fifth generation computing project, so which was initiated by the Japanese ministry meeting. And then the, well, the, even at that time, the, the Japanese, the historically, the, the, our approach to AI has always the, included the infrastructure and the software. And uh, also uh, this kind of the concept leads to our current effort within the ABCI. And then, well, the third generation comes into uh, in the, uh, 2010 time frame. So that the, uh, uh, we are more like focusing on the deep learning types of the applications. And then the, the government is stating that the uh, AI for changing the industry. Of course, there are, uh, there are a lot of the, uh, uh, such in the statement around the world. But the, uh, in, a, in a Japanese case, so some medium enterprises, are okay, so the, we are very interested in to introduce uh, the, uh, such an artificial intelligence technology to change their business model, but they don't know the, uh, how to do it. And then, yeah, again, the left part, so, well, the only 10% of the uh, uh, small, medium enterprises are actively using the artificial intelligence technologies. So this slide, they actually, they studied uh, in, in 2017, but, uh, uh, well, the percentage of uh, such an active portion of uh, the small medium enterprises doesn't change a lot. So this means the uh, still the 80 or 90 percent 
uh, considering the, uh, how to use it, but uh, they didn't know uh, what's in the best way uh, to do so. So the government is strongly pushing, and but the uh, CEO is feeling a very, very serious headache. So and um, the they they have no the uh, the funding or the investment to uh, make the uh, artificial intelligence may happen. So in in these circumstances, so AIST is my organization. Uh, well, the our vertical headquarter is METI and the Ministry of Economy, Trade, and the Industry. And then the, we do rather apply research than uh, the basic sciences. And then the, we're well, more like you know, closely working together with the industry. Well, historically, so the, uh, uh, my or, our original uh, the laboratory the started back in 1891, but uh, uh, well, the, uh, it's been a quite long history of our research institute. But again, the, we are sitting in somewhere between the uh, academia and then the, the industry. So that the, the, our mission is trying to bridge the gap the, uh, the, between our technology and then their business. So well, this situation is the, uh, somehow different from the other part of the world that we're happening. So that the, uh, we're, well, the, the the listening the what the the such an private sector wanted to do, and then okay, so let's think about uh, the uh, well, let's find out the uh, solution to fill the gap. So, and also under the uh, AST, there are seven research department pillars, and my department is in the information technology and the human factors. And then they also to the, the right top, the, you can see that the, uh, there are uh, Meteorology Institute of Japan. It's a close to the function of NIST NIST here. And also the bottom is the Geological Survey of Japan is in the USGS. So that the uh, IT and then the standards and then the uh, geodata is all under uh, the AIST umbrella. But the, uh, in my department, the, I started the Artificial Intelligence Research Center around five years ago. And it was, well, it was somehow uh, it was the, the very early uh, the, uh, uh, research center to serve as a, the core hub for artificial intelligence research. We invite Dr. Uh, the, uh, Junji Tsuji as an head of uh, the uh, our research center, and then the uh, well, the we have uh, doing a lot of the research regarding the mobility of the manufacturing industry, etc. So, given that situation again, so the uh, we are closely well, we offer the artificial intelligence research center as a core hub, and the AI and the data science people are uh, the uh, coming together. Uh, to our the research center, about the uh, well, and then the the also the the there is the big data that we can capture and then we can access the, from the internet and also we have a partnership with the uh, industry, so that the, we we have a lot of the opportunity to have the big data. Yeah, of course the uh, satellite image data is another uh, the the part of it. And then the, the deep learning is a uh, uh, well new engine, which means the uh, you can you can do uh, the main things out of uh, such an huge data. But the, uh, for making things and happen, the high performance computing is the key, the component uh, to make the uh, the the real the big data, and then the deep learning. So uh, well the, the ABCS status. I mean, the uh, traditional HPC and application. So that, that is more like the, uh, uh, the you, can, you can have a mathematical or physical model over here, and then the, you can create a computational model out of such a theory. Then the, uh, if, you, if you need a more the fine granularity, the final granularity, the, the, you need a more computing power to make a 
the more precise in the, uh, the result out of uh, such an assimilation. But uh, there are a lot of the opportunity and then the, there is a uh, space for uh, the, the traditional HPC system as the uh, creating a value. So, but the, on the other hand, so that the, the models in the can be, well, the mathematically well formalized, but the, this type of the, the, the complicated or complex in the situation like in a human, uh, the, the people's mobilities or uh, uh, the understanding the real world and then the, uh, how, or, uh, or that kind of things uh, are not well formalized by the uh, the real the mathematical the formulation, so that the, we are uh, making this kind of the model by gathering a lot of the data, and then the the, the, the processing such and the data, and then create the computational model. Then the if you give some well the situation, then the predict in the future of the the the. The, uh, uh, the the system. So uh, the well, this type of the real world of the problem, the, uh, we need to gather all big data, AI, and the HPC. But again, so uh, the algorithm computing in the big data is in a key component for the uh, current the uh, artificial intelligence. But the the still uh, the missing pieces in the computing. So uh, the, that is because the, even the uh, 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 the cloud service provider, so but they don't see uh, the promising the customers, so that the, uh, they are very afraid of they putting a lot of money to prepare uh, the large scale of the computing facility, and then the also on the other hand uh, the uh, the client. Okay, so we need to do something, but the uh, uh, the, we have no space to uh, try to run our application. So that the, this is a kind of chicken and egg problem. So, uh, so that the, as we are sitting in between the, the industrial sector and then the uh, academia, oh, okay, so AST is happy to offer you uh, the kind of the uh, cloud infrastructure to, well, to help their the big demand. And then the, what uh, the, uh, so that was my role. So I spoke with the uh, uh, vertical headquarters ministry, and then the asking them to have to secure uh, the, some project funding to develop the, this in the, the system, and uh, which is right now uh, we achieved uh, the 150 AI exaflops. So AI exaflops, AI flops means the uh, uh, using the 16 uh, the floating point. Uh, the uh, representation, so that well, that means half precision of the uh, system, and then the, the if we use the uh, double precision, we achieve the thirty-seven point two petaflops. So that is the one of the uh, highest uh, the the score in in Japan right now. So uh, the top five on the list that will be renewed maybe next week, but the, uh, this is the previous one, the latest one. But the uh, ABCI has spotted on the eighth ranking as a, the, the high speed. And also uh, the, their uh, energy saving, the green 500, their performance measure is spotted on the third ranking in the world. So the, the also other the unique feature of this in the ABCI is the offering the, uh, the large scale of storage services uh, the, which is the, the quite compatible uh, with the uh, Amazon S3 computing, uh, com uh, Amazon S3 the APIs, so that the, the client, our client can access to our system the something like the uh, Amazon S3 type of the interfaces. And then the also the we have the well hooked up with the uh, high uh, academic high speed network which is so called the sign of five, so with a hundred at least in hundred gig access to our the cloud services, so that then the people are getting through 
this and the sign at services and to the ABCI quite a quite high bandwidth and then the the of course the we're working together with the uh, the industrial partners so that the, we secure a quite high level of the uh, data encryption or uh, the security services and for the software stack so the uh, this is quite standard the softwares but the well the most of the using software comes from the uh, uh, HPC operational uh, the tools uh, but the uh, some, somehow combining them together of HPC made the uh, AI the components like a uh, uh, container and the engine so that the, the, the kind of the hybrid the system you we were uh, the offering and then the, the for for energy saving system so the uh, maybe I have uh, much time to uh, talk about that but the we we implement the hybrid cooling system so that the, we don't need well the, even in uh, some hot summer in Tokyo area uh, but the, we don't need to the operate uh, the uh, that chiller to uh, the create uh, the cool waters cold waters they well the very hot part of the uh, this computing node is the the, the NVIDIA, oh, I heard uh, yesterday the NVIDIA person has been talking about it, but yeah, we have the V100, quad V100 uh, system as a part of our the single node. And then the, these are very hot part. So that the, we use the kind of liquid cooling uh, to uh, take the uh, uh, such a heat out. And then they also the other part is in the using the, the the standard airflow, but the uh, still uh, the we can give uh, the, thir the thirty two Celsius waters into the uh, system, and then taking out the uh, the lower than uh, forty the, the Celsius degrees. So the maintaining the uh, eight Celsius degree the the differences is in the key to uh, make the system healthy. So they, even in the uh, hot summer, the we uh, survived without using the chillers. And the ABCI they intended to uh, give uh, the uh, this system for the several layers of the uh, the people, the from the expert, the advanced, intermediate, and then the novices. And for the expert, the well, the we were measuring the the benchmark. And then the well, the couple of years ago, so there are not much the the people are they participating in this benchmark. But they, after ABCI uh, got the uh, uh, top score of this the the benchmark, so right after a week, the Google uh, uh, within the TPU is trying to uh, beat us. And then also it is still uh, doing the lot of the very hot. Uh, the competition, and then right now uh, the ABCI our team and then the Fujitsu lab the, is is, is the, the 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 number one uh, holding the number one score, and then therefore the other the purpose of this in the ABCI system the uh, we are, we have uh, the playing the goal uh, system on top of this in the uh, the ABCI, so but. Uh, it is still challenging. And for that, well, the last part, my next actions. So ABCI is a, uh, the kind of artificial intelligence file, meaning that the, uh, uh, the, the even such a small medium enterprise, they don't have uh, the, any of their facility, but the ABCI is in a venue uh, where to such a small medium enterprise just ask. And then to create the uh, this kind of a component, okay. So ABCI is happy to uh, make it, and then uh, back to the uh, SMEs. So this is like a, a semiconductors, uh, the fabless and the fab pipelines. So that the uh, we are offering the small medium enterprises. So such a very simple or uh, the, the the interfaces. And in addition Start to that, using deep learning today with then, Sony's neural network console. And also uh, create the, a new project uh, for, for and a lot of training data, data for the neural network. About the, how to deal with the, uh, 
deep learning or the how to how to images, signals, to and any type of data uh, represented APIs as vectors and matrices can be loaded. So uh, they were uh, working together. Compose functions Sony instantly with a click of a mouse. Giving the very simple and then schematic the uh, deep learning the user interfaces, and then this is quite fancy. But it's very useful. Drag and, and drop, powerful. copy and paste to quickly create the large networks. And having very uh, powerful uh, capability to run. Finish to design the network. It's time to train it. Powered by our neural network libraries, the neural network console trains your network fast. And originally, this system is the developed for uh, kind of after training, alone. Yeah. evaluate the performance of the network. But the, uh, the, we developed the kind of the uh, interfaces in compare with the other networks. networks you've designed at a glance. The training the history of each network is saved for the later browsing. Use the automatic structure search feature to optimize neural networks. Oops, sorry. The neural network console automatically searched for the lightweight, high-performance neural network structure for you. A rich model of sample project will help you on the way to quick master deep learning. So the, the, even the novice doesn't know much about the uh, deep learning uh, type of the, uh, the how to build the uh, network. But and then the, even in, well, the system is running on, well in a desktop system. But also, so you can just click on the. Uh, the server, the system, so the the networks they can be very simply run on our ABCI. So you can scale uh, the, your network then quite quite simply and then they quite quite quickly. And then the some other the next action I'll be a little bit to touch on that. And then the, and the maybe uh, the GOAI, which in the Kimson is Kimson is uh, the chairing and then in the uh, the OGC GOAI working group and then the, which is trying to uh, make the uh, space and the information more personalized so well that means so the you don't need to well the, the we have the uh, simple uh, the single the platform the, where they all so the data is gathered but the the in the context of the each of the the human the in the the, the uh, in that situation, so that the, the you can filter out uh, some of the uh, the information. But the, uh, for for make such and things to happen, we need a very large scale of the computing. So, They gathered in the uh, uh, in a uh, very standard format, but the, depending on the, his context, so the, he is in the, uh, the, the filtering out of a lot of the information. And then the more the information, uh, the, the how to create a three D data generation out of the uh, uh, the similar the situation. And then the well, the the, the late, uh, later later information is placed into the uh, servers, and then the, which can be breaked out into the several the data servers, 
and then the other well the such a the point of a cloud data is dividing into the uh, several the sectors and then the also the gathering such an the the data and then the the users the more object the models and then to create uh, the real 3d model and then the the such an space object as well as the uh, small the object like on the chairs the tables etc so there can be well the used the uses of the, uh, uh, the AI technology to uh, the recognize you know, what is what. So that is a similar thing. And uh, uh, finally, they we're uh, still the working on the satellite data and the archives at the AIST. The, the yesterday, the well, actually I'm hearing that the uh, uh, after the uh, the flooding at in a tropical the area. So there are a lot of the cloud covers at the, the area. And so the optical the sensor can capture the images on the ground. But for the uh, the solid data, the, the, you can see the, the, uh, the ground and also the polarizing the data as we gather together with the solid data. So the, the, we can need more, well, uh, lively the image they can be created but the uh, the original saw data is actually black and white uh, so that the the we are the combined together with the uh, optical data and the saw data and then by using a lot of the uh, uh, the deep learning type of the application they, to see the what's in the real color the under uh, the cloud so making the training in the uh, such an assault data with an optical data, and then they make a make a uh, this the kind of the image data out of the using the combining the using of the uh, saw data and then the the optical data, and then uh, the last three the the future actions uh, the uh, well again the well, we have to consider the modern uh, more modern architecture uh, but the uh, still the layered architecture is the same and but uh, uh, the maybe in the middle space I, I'm saying that the, uh, there is an open grid service but the the model has been changed by saying that the uh, cloud service etc and then also the way of planning to getting into the ABCI to the all hopefully and then the can and they accommodate this kind of the services. So, and then the, the, even in Japan, well, the, we have a commercialized and cloud service in the providers. Uh, some of you might be familiar with in the Sakura, the, which is offering the Telus uh, as an open and free, uh, the such an, uh, well, satellite imagery data and the geo data and the platform. So, well, supported by uh, METI. So, this is the uh, kind of the great challenge to make the uh, such a data for, for the business. So that's a so-called open and free data platform. And then the, well, the lot of the internet folks is and the working on internet service people are trying to make a business on top of this and the TELUS services. And of course, and the standardization is in the key for the future. And then the, for the summary, the, again, the ABCA has been operational since the, two, the, the last year. They're supporting SMEs and the, their AI challenges. And the Geo AI is a promising an application on top of ABCI and then other high performance AI. And then quality of satellite imagery is getting much richer, combining optical the data and the cell data, they, which is also powered by the ABCI. And then future actions uh, propose, uh, I'm proposing, including the, well, again, the architecture standards. And then the, back to the uh, uh, such a movie, but in uh, easy access to you, such a monster power. So thank you again and thank you for your kind of attention. Sorry, a little bit. Thank you.
are these any of these systems open for international researchers to yes. use? Yes, yes, yeah. Well, at least we need a contract, of course, but uh, it's open up opportunity for the, uh, everybody. Yes. Thanks. That was simple. <laughs> The, the TELUS stuff. Yes. Ah. Um, is that uh, Aster data and the like? Uh, oh, what, what all data is free from Japan and TELUS? It's uh, the Parser. Yes, oh, and then yeah. Parser, Parser Field, and the some of the uh, Asnar. Mm. But the, uh, you can download it. So the, you have to work on in the uh, on the TELUS platform. Yeah, yeah, yes. But you have access to that data. Yeah, yeah, you can access that's to new. the data. Yes. Yeah, yeah that's, that's a brand new the yeah. approaches. Okay, good. Well, yeah, to there. Okay. Thank you again. Thank you. My favorite part was the standards action. Oh, Thank you. Could have, could have <laughs> more. So um, we have our second presentation on actions. I hope you remember all the questions. Yes, all right. Um, so um, first I wanted to present him as Dr. Andrew Brooks, but then he said he spent enough time with us these last two days, we can call him Andy. So I'd like you to welcome Andy. He's the chief data scientist, GA. Uh, his LinkedIn page is one of my favorites because he <laughs> says his job title, chief data scientist, what do you do? One line create value out of data. And that's what he's gonna talk to us about. All Great. yours. Awesome, thank you, I appreciate the intro. Um, can I walk around it all or do I need to stay right here on the mic? I got that, okay, that, that's a little too Las Vegas. So I'll stay up here, this will work. Um, no, it's good, this will, this will be okay. I can uh, speak You well. will be constrained, how can we add okay. value? You know? Well, no, it was, um, so the title for that, or like where that came from is when I joined the IC, because I've been there about two years or so. Um, and I'd, I'd been in the industry before that, you know, and here in the Bay Area on the West Coast, and it's one of like, oh, you're going into the IC, and it was truly like when I got recruited from my job, it was an unlisted phone number that, you know, you never answer one of those, like when your phone rings, and I was in my kitchen, and I was about ready to go out for a run, and it answered, and they're like, hi, this is da 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 from the intelligence community, and I stand in my kitchen in San Francisco, and I looked out the window, and I'm like, what is going on? <laughs> like, I thought this was a prank for about 20 minutes or so. Um, but truly, that's my job. I have a kind of a rare role in the intelligence community, particularly with um, NGA and then I'm public in what I do. And a lot of the work I talk about is public in what I do. Um, as a chief data scientist, it's essentially what I do is figure out how to create value out of our data. And I've done that for about 20 years or so. Um, all with tech companies and startups, corporate data brokers, Yahoo Research, things like that out here. Um, there's some new form of data. What are we going to do with that? Right. And it's I've done that with supply chain data, health, um, bioinformatics. Um, my dissertation was on physiological data, heart rate variability. If you go into that specificity, things like that. Um, but this is what I do is figure out how do you create value out of data, whatever that's going to look like. And what I want to talk to you about today is the efforts that we've got at NGA to be able to do this. How do you take NGA and I'll go into an overview of who we are and what we do. How do you do this like at scale? Right? How do you do these sorts of things? As I jokingly say, we can't TensorFlow our way out of this problem or put things in the cloud and things like that. This is not a technical problem or a technological problem. This is bigger than that. It's more like a cultural people and data sort of thing. So I'll go into that today. Um, this whole talk is unclassified. Everything here, you can ask me any sort of questions like that. I wanna try and answer as much as possible. So we'll save some time for that. Um, if we do bump into things where I can't disclose that, I will just call it outright you know, and just say, hey, I can't answer that right here. Um, but that doesn't mean I'll punt. I'll take that question and go find out, see if I can get an answer and communicate it back because I want to be able to answer questions from the public and what we do. Um, so let's talk about this almost like the gimme obvious slide. Like where are we today with like data science, particularly with geospatial? Um, let me pause there and go, it's like, well, what is data science? And you heard it earlier. Um, it's, I, I describe it as the art and craft of people leveraging technology to create value out of data, right? That's the way I look at it. And I'm really pushing that within our agency, but more broadly in what we do. And that this is a real, like, you can say revolution that's happening or is changing and such. And that it's more than just um, big data is here. It's more than put your data in the cloud. It's more than use NLP. It's more than using AI. This is like a top to bottom rethinking of like how we do stuff, how we do our work. And that's what I want to go into today with NGA. Um, and what's happening is just like, the obvious, right? So we've got more and more data um, coming from more and more sensors, 
more and more techniques to be able to do things. Um, for us, like in our space, like in national security, it's like we got like pretty potent, let's say, adversaries. Uh, Russia, China, the two plus three, the way that we describe it. We have some incredible capabilities in this space and are moving very, very quickly, which is a big focusing mechanism for our efforts in our agency. Where do you start with using data science, right? You could cover so many sorts of things, and one is rallying towards focusing, how do we best counter and protect national security for the country, for what we're trying to do? So like, here's where the world is really today. And what I like to push in, into next is like, well, where do we think it's gonna go next? Like, what is it? Are we just gonna get more data? Um, are we just gonna get more sensors? Is it gonna get more complex and those sorts of things? And um, as an economist, I love to try and predict things. I'm a prediction market kind of guy, but like, I don't know where this is going to go, right? Like what, what the framework is or like how the future is going to go and placing bets on that. And that's not really the space that I'm in. And particularly is like in national security, the Intel community is placing bets like that. We just don't do it. Um, what I look for instead is like, okay, like what do we want that future to look like and how do we design it? And that's much more of what I'm going to talk about here is one where how do we take efforts in our like individual work roles? So like specifically like how you spend your time as well as like on teams and in organizations and particularly in organizations like this, how do we collectively move towards this future that we really want? And I kind of, I'll project here a little bit on like what we want that future to look like. Um, one where it's like, like geospatial data or data in general, it's like for good, right? Like, let's just say that, like we want that to be for good. We want data to be collected, analyzed and provide value to users, to people, things like that, move things forward, right? And I want to say that just because it's like, that's not always the case, right? <laughs> like there's a lot of instances we'll read about in the press where data is collected, particularly geospatial, longitude, latitude, timestamp, um, and is not necessarily used like in really positive ways, replicating what has been done, let's say example with redlining, if you're familiar with that and doing weblining and all sorts of things and kind of going these like break, break, that's not what we want. We want geospatial data in particular to be a positive force for good. And knowing when we say that, like things get awkward. Like that's kind of hard because we got to figure out what good means and how to do that. And that's what we'll talk about in here. Um, one of the things I look at like in my work is like just kind of laying that out there. Like where do you begin with doing efforts in this space, right? How do you look at it? Um, one that I like to look, go and try and find is like existing frameworks, I'll call it, or models, not really like in a data science model kind of sense, but like ways to help kind of guide our thinking. Um, one that I've pulled on lately from a couple of weeks ago um, was from Stanford's D School. Is anybody familiar with Stanford's D School up 101 here? Awesome, okay, great. Um, so this is a slide that they put out a little while ago and I'll zoom in and talk a little bit more about it. Um, but Stanford's D School is, is, is really awesome and that's an interdisciplinary program um, you can call it multidisciplinary program. But what is that? It's a program where it's like the people who go there are not like designers. They're like regular people, right? You know, and they're coming from different disciplines and backgrounds and things like that. And they come together to try and solve like complex problems, right? So you'll get like a computer scientist, an engineer, a philosopher, a linguistics major, and um, a business school student, right? Trying to solve some sort of problem space like in the world and things like that. And what I love it is it has a very holistic look at like how we solve problems in the world. Very diverse stakeholders, diverse viewpoints, different sorts of skills and backgrounds focused on a specific problem set and trying to move in that direction of what they're trying to do. Now, the D School's been around for a number of years. I remember when I was first inkling of like, oh, maybe should I quit my industry job and go into graduate school, is hanging out at the D School and being like, this is kind of the way that I think, right? But it's, I didn't go to the D School, I went to Cal. Um, and it's like adopted many of these sorts of models in the work that I do. Um, What's fascinating is I'll step through this and hopefully folks can read it. It's a little challenging, um, but it's one where they really look at it. It's like, if we're gonna go out there and solve problems, particularly with data and technology, um, where do we kind of sit? And this is not necessarily a ladder, so to speak, but like, where do we sit or where are you situated? And more so, what are the types of questions and things that we need to wrestle with if we're trying to create product services, technology, or the future of something, right? You know, what are those sorts of things? And I'll step through this, but it's all the way from like, in this world is like the data. Right, like what's the underlying data that we're working with? In our world, we're like, awesome, we've got some new synthetic aperture radar data coming on, what can we, you know, what is that? What can we do with it, right? Well, that's like, that's one slice of this, right? What are the other technologies that we're using, um, which the previous sp speaker spoke about, is like, what are we using to say, crunch, analyze that sort of data? Um, other folks who are interested in here, particularly like Esri and others, it's like, well, what are the products that we would create out of that? Um, one that I'm really keen on and focused and we'll dive into is what's the overall experience? 
for users, like for us, our analysts in the agency, which I'll go into, all the way down to door kickers, we call them war fighters, things like that. What is that experience? How do you consider that? Um, what are the broader systems that we interact with, right? So like a system, so like an organization or a culture or a place, how do you do these things? As well as then looking at what are the implications of this type of work and what we're trying to do. What I love to use is this as a framework is to kind of help situate teams who are creating and building, designing things, particularly in the space that are moving very quickly, to kind of structure their thoughts. Like, where do we sit? And I'm going to take you through a team at NGA who is doing this type of work, is really trying to get folks, where do we sit here? What do we think about these other things? As we're building this, what do we need to be mindful of? Who should we go hang out and talk to and listen to and learn from who may be doing other work in this space so we can then better create and design what this future space is that we want to do? So I'm going to go step through this here in a little bit. Um, as a level set, just as like who is NGA, well, this is from our webpage, uh, we deliver world-class geospatial intelligence that provides a decision advantage to policymakers, warfighters, intelligence professionals, and first responders, right? That's our official boilerplate of what we do inside of there. Um, the way I always like to describe it is, you know, hurricane disaster response. We're the folks who can help figure out if that runway is long enough and if it's open to land a plane on it that's got enough water to help the people who are there like that sort of focus thing, all the way down to the decision-making part about, um, well, we've been tracking this guy. We think he might be the head of ISIS. Is this the place where he lives? Is this the map? Is his location? Is he going to be there? What are the collateral damage risks if we send a team in there in a helicopter to go get him in a foreign land? All that kind of stuff. Those are the types of things that we really work on. I really like to try and situate that in the decision-making of like world space of our users and our customers and what they do inside the agency, right? So it's a big range of things all kind of like high stakes, you know, not like more or less important or other sorts of things, but it's like, you kind of got to be right. You know, if you're using data science to work in these sorts of spaces, like you kind of got to be right, because if you're not, you're going to end up in the news. People are going to die. Like the stakes are pretty high. And as um, I like to say, it's like, we're not just putting little blue dots on the map. <laughs> you know, like this is pretty high stakes type of work of what we do. Um, NGA in general is pretty quiet. You know, most folks don't really know who we are inside the intelligence community. Like when I joined, folks are like, well, I know the CIA, I know the NSA, and those other folks. So who are you guys? And I was like, oh, we're the map people, you know, because you can kind of just pass under that, and then you can kind of just duck and just walk away. But it's like, it's not just the map people. We do all this other crazy kind of cool stuff too. But again, like I said, is being due into the IC um, based out here on the West Coast is you kind of be a little quiet about that. Um, but it's like, we have a pretty cool story to tell. Like what we do is pretty fascinating and amazing. Um, so it's a really fun, cool place to be. All right, so what I want to do now is spin into a very specific instance of a team who is out there, I would say, creating the future of data science within NGA and the role that they're doing and the actions that they're taking. And I'm going to use the framework from Stanford's D School to help make that like applicable so it can grok. So hopefully there'll be some examples there. And then we can go into some questions on that. Um, the team that I'm going to talk about is one called, um, it's called the Data Core. Um, I would show you their pictures. Right, but it's the intelligence communities. So you don't even want to put people's faces up. Um, so it's like they don't even want us to put pictures of buildings and things like that. Well, this one I pulled from Trevor Peglin, who's I, I don't know if folks are familiar with him. I love Trevor's art. Um, it's totally great. It's cool. It's fun. And our, our public release people are always a little scared when I put his kind of stuff up. Um, but it's like this is our building. So this is where we are in Springfield, Virginia. It's one of our locations. Um, we have a tremendous number of analysts here. We also have some in uh, St. Louis, Missouri, as well as distributed all over the world where people are making big key decisions and such. The team data core I want to talk to you about is one that's just about two years old. My first year I was at NGA, I was the founder of that and led that team and grew it from, uh, I think we had four of us, to about 80 in a period of a year. And the challenge of that team or what they were set out to do is literally create this future of using data science within the agency. Because we had folks who were coming to us, um, industry partners and others saying like, hey, put your stuff in the cloud hey, use data science and all these sorts of things. And there was a very great deliberate effort to kind of be like, pause time out, like, what are we trying to do? Like, how are we going to do this, like, effectively? And what's amazing is the agency allocated a huge number of resources and people to go out and figure out what this is. So as founding this team, it was one of, how do we bring about this cultural shift and change? And I kind of took this, like, social contagion network theory model of, like, let's get this team together of highly capable people with very diverse backgrounds to go out and solve problems with inside the agency. So earlier there was the talk about like, oh, Excel spreadsheets and things like that. That was this team. So going out and working with our analysts in the building um, who are looking and collecting and analyzing data informed decision making to warfighters and others to help them solve their data problems. Like if we want to figure out what this future is going to be, 
go sit with the folks and go create it and go build it. And that's this team of data core folks where we hired about 80 in a year. Um, the original thought was like, oh, you're doing data science, so hire 80 data scientists. And I was like, no, no, we don't want 80 data scientists. Um, I need a chunk of those folks, right, who can do that, where it's pure like writing algorithms and deploying them and seeing how you can do all that kind of stuff. Um, but much more, I was like, for those of us who have all done this work, like that's part of it, but like most of it is all the like medical scut work kind of stuff, right? Or it's like getting the data prepared, building pipelines and all those sorts of things. So split the model of the team up in such that we have data managers, data engineers, data stewards, data analysts, who all like get the data ready to go, get it prepped and things like that. Um, a key bit is many, I'd say if not all of these folks have at least some background in like user experience research. Um, we riffed and pulled that from US Digital Service and 18F and like my prior work of getting folks who are like have deep technical knowledge and things and at the same time can sit down with an analyst who doesn't know anything about Python, doesn't know anything about any of these technologies or something and can listen and empathize and understand what their life is like and how to do these sorts of things. So this team of 80 folks, what they do is they go out and deploy in, in teams of four or five and go sit with our analyst users throughout the building to figure out how they do their work, right? How do we solve their problems? How do we create the future of data science at a very grassroots low level of like sitting with folks and being like, okay, how do you do your work? How do we improve it? What's this going to look like, right? So very much from the bottom up. Um, to be clear, one of the things is this is not opposed to top down, right? Like this is coming, we're doing it in multiple directions, but this is one that's very much situated in engaging with folks and pushing these things forward. So what I want to do is step through this team and really how they operate, so like in a specific case, with this model and how they're creating the future of data science in NGA, in our place, um, using this sort of framework. And what one thing I really want folks to think about is like what we're doing and how we're doing it. Um, it's not really just because it's like in the DOD or in the federal government or it's in the intelligence community. We are an organization like many others who have been collecting volumes of data for a very long period of time have been creating value out of it in different sorts of ways, have all sorts of bureaucracies and weird things and operate in the market or an economy and such. And it's one where it's like the lessons from this team can apply in a lot of different places, not just like in the IC or the DOD or the federal government. So I mentioned with that team, um, they kind of have a different background or experience in the work that they do and that many of them have like this user experience research sort of background. So using the framework here from the D school is like, where would they really start? Right? A lot of folks would kind of think, it's like, oh, data scientists, where are they going to start? Let's start engaging with users and talking about the data. And it's like, well, I already kind of gave it away. Um, but no, it's like they talk about the experience part, right? So someone will come to them and say, like, hey, I've got a data problem or I've got like a challenge. Here's what I'm trying to do. And they're like, okay, they'll listen to that, right? And they're like, okay, well, like, we're going to come on over and we're going to hang out and see what you do. Like, what are you trying to do? Like, what does that work? And they always try and situate it, this team and really trying to fundamentally understand the experience of a user. Now that sounds really abstract, so make, I'll make it more specific. Um, we've got analysts whose like, job and responsibility is to figure out like, what's driving around in the back of white pickup trucks in West Africa, right? Like that sounds really nuts, but it's just like we do. We have people who specialize in these sorts of things. So the key thing is going and figuring out what else their experience in doing their work and doing their trade and doing their craft, what does that look like? right? To get some real ground level understanding of what it's like to be an analyst. And this is really important because I forgot to mention, you know, these 80 folks that we hired to come join this team, I think over two thirds to maybe three quarters were from outside the intelligence community. They were from outside the federal government. They were from different places where it's like, they don't really know what an, being an analyst means, right? Which is kind of great. Like you're naive. You can just go in there and start asking all these like obvious, ridiculous questions, uh, which is great. But this is where they start and they situate their work. So really is going in and understanding is like, how do you do this today? What is the role of data in this experience? What works, doesn't work? Uh, what kind of policies are, are you running up against to try and do your work? Stuff like that. So trying to get that ground level, very visceral learned experience from the folks who are doing this work. From there, they go down to, okay, let's start talking about the data, right? Where is this data coming from? How are you using it? Um, is it big data, air quotes? Is it small data living in spreadsheets, things like that? trying to get that sense of what that work is and how they do it, right? So going from that experience to going to, let's look at the ground data part. We're purposely not looking at technologies. We're purposely not looking at products or anything like that. Just that fundamental, what are you trying to do? And like, what's the data that you're working with? So a lot of this really at this point is engaged in conversation and a whole lot of drawing stuff on boards, right? To try and really map and diagram what that experience is really like for these folks, right? Um, 
which you can run up against people who don't want to do that because they want to talk about technology or products and things like that. And this really exposes how people do their work and their craft. So you bring people together to figure out, well, how do you really do it? And then you document all this to get smarter about it, right? Next phase that they go into is moving from the data part up to the technologies part, right? So like, okay, I understand. I got a sense of how you do your work and what it is, the role of data in that. So like, get a sense of like, where is the technology and what you're doing, right? What, what do they think technology is? How is it used? Again, we're not using products yet. We'll go up the ladder and get there in a second. Um, but it's much more of like, what is that fundamental technology underneath there? And for our users in particular, we're trying to work on developing a solution or a problem with them. What's their literacy with using different forms of technology? Where are they? We have an incredibly diverse workforce. People from all over, people from all different backgrounds, educational skill backgrounds and things like that. And the key folks with this team is going out and meeting people where they are, right? So if you've got someone who's describing a problem and they're working in Excel, if you start bombing in that you're gonna start doing stuff in Python and all this crazy stuff, that's not gonna map. Like they're just, it's not gonna get picked up. It's not gonna work. Um, so in this is looking at what are the technologies that they have today that they have literally like on their desktop with ready access, which if you in the, in the DOD is like, doesn't have to be ATO'd or whitelisted or anything crazy like that, but like truly that, and then solving that problem with what they've got there, as well as I noted like the diagram with the data flows and everything, mapping where this could go into the future and working with those folks. And I'll talk more about that. So the technology side, and then you can kind of see where we're going, gave it away, um, is the, the product side, right? So like, how does the experience, how does the data, how do the technologies, and then how do the products all roll together in that experience of what they're trying to do? So going to that, um, oftentimes we can find, give the story away, is like really a lot of the challenges folks are running into have nothing really to do with like the product. They'll maybe complain about the blue button doesn't work or something like that, but really it's a fundamental thing is like the data is not really that good or the underlying technology doesn't work or the policy isn't enabling them to do their things. So that's why this is kind of last, like in what the team will look like is the product side. Um, Time-wise, I'll move here a little bit quicker, is one of like for this team is there's 80 of them. We have 14,000 employees, right? This is kind of hard. Like how do you do this like really like at scale? So this team in particular really looks at how do they use the system you can call it bureaucracy, um, to leverage and expand the value of the work that they're trying to do, right? So it truly is one where it's like when this team kind of formed or stood up in the, in the parlance or lingo of the agency is um, had a handful of folks coming to them with, hey, I got a problem. Can you help me solve it? That kind of thing. Um, and looking at that and trying to be like, okay, well, remember here, we're trying to solve problems, but we're also trying to change the agency and the culture, right? So like, who are those like awesome rock star customers that you want to have. In the consumer world, I, when I was studying this, it was like lead users, even before early adopters, right? People who are doing crazy gonzo stuff that you're like, okay, if we can meet their need and help them, they're going to evangelize for us. They're going to tell their friends, do all those sorts of things. So that's a lot of like how this team works, like in the system, really, because a lot of people now, they're very successful, this team. So you have a lot of people coming to you with like, hey, we want your help and assistance. You got to kind of think strategically over like, okay, we got to solve this problem. We got to solve this problem because if we get this one, we can string together value for the agency, right? And I've kind of been a little vague there on what I mean by value, and I'll go more into that. Um, but it's really one where it's like, how do we leverage the institution and the platform that we have to then scale the impact of what we're trying to create? Right? You do it in this space and be very deliberate and be very mindful of this. If we're trying to create and build the future of things. For an agency like ours, this is almost like the most critical part. It's like, how do you understand the system to scale what you're trying to do? Who are those people that you need to get to, those teams you need to get to? Um, we talked earlier in our small group, do you have the right color of money? And that probably doesn't make any sense, like if you're not from the DOD or the IC space, but it's like money and funding and things like that are incredibly critical to figure out how you're going to scale impact. Right? Coming from the commercial world, I was, it was like nuts that you had different colors of money. It wasn't being profit. Anyway, it's one of being aware of the systems and how they work. Trying to create this future can't just be about the experience of the data. It is these systems as well. And here's where this team is really getting interesting too, is um, much more in, our, in the work of this team because they're moving from that space of pulling stuff out of spreadsheets and doing things to looking much more at like the implications of the work that they're doing, right? Um, and I can go into detail on that in the sense that it's like the implications of speeding up a workflow and making it that much faster because there is that thing where it's like, well, it used to take 10 people. I'm just making, I'll just make up some numbers. This is not a real case. It would take 10 people two weeks to do one thing that would spit something out. And now it takes like one person clicking on a script and they can do it in like 10 minutes. Well, like 
<laughs> there's a lot of implications for that, right? With regard to employment and workforce and staffing and billets and all that kind of stuff. And billets just has to do with the number of people and the jobs and things like that. Again, weird lingo. Uh, but it's like looking at the implications of the work that they're trying to do. So it's just one of, in that sense, of like how it impacts the workforce. In our lingo, we call it tradecraft. Really, it's like how you do your job, right? How does that impact those sort of things? Um, what are the first order effects, second order effects, third order effects for this? What's been nice too with this team is they've been focusing on the implications at that level. And now they've been able to get, they've been quite successful in the work that they do. They're starting to look at and discuss implications or folks are looking to them for like, what are the implications of doing data science and things like that in the entire intelligence community? So stakeholders or team members on this group are stakeholders on the um, data science tradecraft initiative. Other things that you might hear about like out here on the West or in the media about like, hey, what is the Department of Defense, the intelligence community doing with data science? And then they'll have like a working group and things like that. These folks, these team members are on these boards and panels guiding that. And what I love with that is because it's situated by folks who have actually done the work. Right? I mean, that seems kind of ridiculous to say, but it's one where it's like, no, it's like you've got people who are in these conversations talking about the intersection of AI and ethics with, say, regard to counterterrorism, with regard to targeting and things like that, where it comes from this, like, not just academic kind of discussion or model of, like, well, what's the ethics of using automated da, 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 to do some certain type of work? You've got folks who have done this, right, who have done it for real, whether themselves, as well as situated with our workforce and our users to solve this sort of problem that what they're trying to do. And I think this is fascinating work because it's one where the implications part is one that really gets talked about, like in the press. What are the implications of using artificial intelligence for national security and things like that? And this team is really driving and informing that dialogue and conversation with that real world, here's what's working, here's what's not, here's where we go. So um, I'll start wrapping here. And it's just one, it's like, I think this framework is a phenomenal look at, or it's a way to, or a template to start looking at how do we build and create things, right? Where do we sit ourselves in this kind of, you can call it a ladder or a space, you know, to think about, hey, I'm trying to create X or Y. Um, am I living in the data space? Am I living in the technology space? Or where is that? You know, where am I? Um, and it's, I think it's a tremendous lens for trying to figure out whether it's geospatial data science or data science in general is like, how are we going to create what this future could be? Right? How do we be very holistic in the work that we're trying to do? How do we be very conscientious and deliberate about the actions that we take? Because it's one of these, it's like some of us feel like we've been doing this kind of stuff for a long time. It's still really early in the book, right? And like what we're trying to do is going to have tremendous implications or ramifications in the years going forward, right? I mean, we forget that because we're too situated. We're maybe in our like awesome innovation bubble of doing this cool work and things like that, but there's going to be a big ripple effect. So it's one of like, how do we use these sorts of tools and frameworks to be very deliberate in the work that we're trying to do and going forward. Um, so like my action or my call really for, you know, for like OGC in this space is one is like going back to that diagram or you know, riff your own, make a new one. Um, where do you sit in that space? Like literally like, where do you sit right now? Like in your work and in your job, what would be the impact of going in a separate direction and going engaging with other sorts of folks? How do you think holistically in the work that you're trying to do? Right. How do you go from the work that you are there to what is the minimal, you know, minimal viable product that you can do? How can you start a conversation with other folks to start thinking about implications and things like that? And then just jump in there and start doing it, particularly from events like this, which I think are tremendous, where it's like you get folks together and you can nerd and grok out and you go like, OK, what is the one thing that we can do coming out of this? Right. Just to start moving us a little bit closer in this direction of creating what we want to be able to do um, with geospatial and uh, data science in general. So I'll wrap there just because I think we've got maybe about 15 minutes. Hopefully we can get a little bit more on time. Um, happy to take any questions folks have about this prior work, where the sources from this came from. Um, I forgot to mention a couple credits on some of this. Um, didn't get on the slide in time, but that's the Stanford slide was from Stanford D School. Um, I got that from a tremendous event that I was at a couple weeks ago called the Machine Learning and User Experience um, Meetup Group, which is phenomenal. Like if you're in this space and you're here in the Bay Area, it's a great group of folks who is a lot of practitioners who get together and just look at like, and they really wrestle with great questions where it's like, all right, so we got some machine learning thing. We're going to put it in some product. What's the user experience research of that? And like, what do we do about that? And like, they wrestle with those sorts of questions. And it's lots of, uh, I would say like well-known, but like just 
great people to interact with. And this arose, some of the slides and some of the content arose a little bit from that. Um, and it was a great community of folks to get together to help me try and figure out like, what are these various things that we're working on in the agency? And then provide this lens framework that is ideally or hopefully useful to the public to understand what we're doing inside the, inside the intelligence community, which is very smoke and mirrors often. Um, but also too, is folks can take this and riff it and use it in different sorts of ways to go and create what they're trying to do with data science. So I'll break there and then welcome any questions. So thank you. What's your question? Oh, okay. Here's one. Do you have one? I got one. Question. And we really do have time. <laughs> We're good. Uh, I found it interesting that the implications in your order came last. Can you explain a little bit more um, why experiences came first and implications came last? Sure. Part of that just literal flow of storytelling, <laughs> I think is one. Um, it's definitely one of those as you bounce around. Um, the way I describe it like with the team is it always starts with the experience you know, for that team who is doing their work. And I'll be clear too is um, Data Core is one effort inside NGA who's doing this type of work. We have other teams that I can give you word spaghetti over acronyms and things like that, but there's other teams who are doing that. Um, but you always, we always start with the experience part is really that ground level of what are you trying to do and how do you solve it? And sometimes you go to the implications very, very quickly because you can quickly understand like, oh, this is their experience. And if we do this one magical thing over here, whoa, like that could change a whole lot of stuff. So sometimes it will jump to that implications conversations before we even get to the data or the technology part. So that was just, you know, challenges of linear storytelling. So, yeah. <laughs> Hopefully that wasn't a dodge, but yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, in the back. Hi, yeah. Um, I liked how you said that it was really valuable for you to have that kind of informal shop talk at the ML event you went to. And I wonder if that's uh, a challenge within the intelligence community that you don't have those informal spaces to do that kind of technical kind of information sharing with other people in the geospatial community. I would say it, it um, yes. It is a challenge, it is a barrier. Um, we have like informally inside NGA, our, our own kind of meetup groups where folks will get together and like nerd out over coffee and things like that to do that. Um, that's a great first start. It's one I'm really trying to push and we have advocates in the agency who are like, I know folks at Google <laughs> are wrestling with this, right? Part of what you get into there is a cultural thing. A lot of the folks that we have in our agency who have been there are like, well, I work in the IC, I, can't, I don't wanna list that I'm public and this sort of thing, so I don't wanna engage. Or there's the perception too that like nobody wants to talk to the IC, nobody wants to talk to us and those sorts of things. And anytime I hear those, I was like, you know what, just go find one person. You'll find one person and you can engage in a conversation. But I'm with you, it's like, I would love to get more of the NGA folks and I'll even say CIA, NSA and others who are wrestling with geospatial data and trying to figure out like, what do we do? Engaging with, I'll just call it folks outside of the IC. Because most of really what we're running into and the challenges that we have have nothing to do with the, being in the intelligence community, nothing to do with national security or anything. It's one of those where it's just like, how do we get everybody to agree to a schema, right? <laughs> you know, like, which is legit, you know, like those sorts of things and trading that sort of knowledge back and forth is key and critical. Um, we as an agency or we in the intelligence since intelligence community can't rest on the, oh, we have to hide behind here because things are, things are different um, or security and things like that. No, like the example I just gave is like, no, we should totally be engaging with others about how to do that. Um, so what I'll often do is take it from that like, oh, we're scared of engaging with you know, these folks out there as I'll broker them with colleagues from grad school and others and say like, hey, this group over here at, at, at Amazon and the MLX Europe group is wrestling with that same question. Just give them a call. Right? And just started like very low level kind of conversations, interactions. But I would love to have much, I don't want to say formal, but like a lot broader engagement with industry and others, academia, other folks who are wrestling with these sorts of challenges. So I think we'll all get smarter and better create that future by engaging with each other. Yeah. Sort of following up on that question, yeah. um, how much of the data that you use is, are just open data versus uh, internal or proprietary data or data that's specific to NGA? And I guess in terms of that, you talked about experiences and developing um, solutions to them, or you want walk through your process to do that. Um, are those, again, like internal process kinds of things, or are they also you're dealing with your broader issues of trying to apply many data sources to solving your broader mission? Yeah. So, so the first question is, um, I can't answer that. Like specifically, it's like, what's the distribution, you know, like pie chart? 
pie chart of, you know, you'll call it exquisite sensor data versus other sorts of things. Um, I can just say is like the data scientist is like, I love more varied structured forms of data and there's tremendous sources available open um, that'll make our decision makers more informed. So it's one is I look at as us as an agency is like more of that. You know, I would love to have more open data available to us. Why open is same reasons of open source or anything like that. You got a lot of eyeballs, you know, filling all the blanks, um, that kind of stuff. Would love to have more of that. Can you read, what was your second question one more time, if you can? Maybe that. Okay. Or it's maybe it was like the impact of the work that they're trying to do is a business process or external. Um, it's a mix of both. A lot of the work right now is the business process. You know, trying to clean up their trade craft of how they do it. Not clean it up, but it's make it more efficient and structured and documented. Yeah. Yes. So I, I like the way you sort of uh, walk through sort of um, those particular steps, and that resonated with me as being very prescriptive. Uh, and so I guess I, my question is, uh, do you ever sort of as an agency step through sort of that uh, interaction with an agent, with an agency, uh, a consumer really of your data and say, we would normally tell you this is a better way to do it. This is more information that you get or this is a different methodology. You ever step through and say, I think your construct is wrong. I think the future is this and not this. So you know, one, one example of that is, changing the nature, nature of, way, of the way an agent works. So, you know, most folks have been sort of, as I understand it, a group like recipient um, has kind of said, listen, the agent is the gatekeeper and we want to make them better at what they do. Have you ever challenged a model like that with data and machine learning? Uh, again, that's one where it's hard to answer that like super in specifics, like with, with because of classification stuff, but I would say is yes. Like we challenge and we push back. <laughs> I do. Yeah, and the team does. Questions online? Yeah, there was. But okay. May not be online on this one. Is it pulled up? Yes, this. Can I ask a question? Sure. Anybody from here wants to ask so we're, we're even? Come on, people. All right. Can I ask my question? All right. Very quickly. Yeah. Um, you know, the process that, this, that you described. Um, can you comment on whether you discovered or your team discovered anything special about the geo part, the location part, that makes it different from other domains? Not the intel, but like just actually the types of data that you're dealing with. Is there anything special there? Um, I would say, okay, so one that I would step into is just like how we store it has been a bit of a challenge. I don't mean just like putting it in the cloud or something like that, but it's just like how... I might have to come back and answer that a second time, like offline, but it's like the first one, or just not offline, but just clear the answer, so to speak. Um, but one that I would think about is regard like what makes it different with geospatial is I would say the data storage aspects of things. And I can go into more detail, I think, following up with you of what that is. Um, but it's just not as straightforward as like when I worked in like physiological data and things like that. You're like, that's ah, pretty straightforward. We can store that. Um, this is different, you know, whether it's the magnitude of the data or trying to tag it in different sorts of ways just made it a lot harder what we're trying to do. So it's a little bit of a duck, but I guess it's got to be really careful. OK, thanks. Yeah. Um, so in ye yesterday's session, there was a talk, uh, which I think was good in setting the, the landscape for the industry, where there's a lot more data sets and types of data coming. And someone mentioned metadata of data itself. But then on the other hand, on the processing side, you've got hardware improvements with GPUs. And then you've got software improvements with um, rewriting a Python script with C plus to have greater efficiencies. Yeah. Do you see if? Um, it's a race between there's always going to be more and more volumes of different types of data compared to the computing power and processing power that can do that? Or will the processing power eventually catch up and be able to uh, computate all this? And, and the reason for that is from an analyst perspective, we would shift or allocate our time from focusing on domain data and specialized data sets as opposed to focusing on improving the models. And yeah. Did you ask me to predict the future? <laughs> I got that. <laughs> Government level, I feel like you have the best perspective on the big. The big. It's one where I look at it as like, um, I get more and more excited by the data aspect of things. Maybe that's because I'm less of an electrical engineer, you know, in like the, the computer hardware stuff is I always go as like, that'll be enough. Let's get smarter about what data is coming and how we use it and how it's tagged such that we can take advantage of the super fast GPU thing that's coming. 
right? That's that's where I focus more of my energy. Um, one is, like I said, is a bias just from less familiarity with that. Um, but that's one where it's like this part is like my agency or my teams. We have much more, I don't want to say control, but it's just kind of is like much more focus and directed action on that. We can impact that more than say waiting for the next supercomputer, things like that. Because sometimes we'll get that. It's like someone will come to us and say, hey, I got this data problem and my boss said that we should go use the supercomputer. And we're like, what? You know, like, what are you talking about? You know, so it's like, I always just try and table those, like on the technology side, just table that down a little bit and push it just because it's like, that's just going to keep going. It's going to keep growing faster. Let's focus our energy over here. Almost sometimes it's a little bit of, a, I'll say it, a red herring, right? If we start focusing on those things and the, the power of compute that's coming, it's like, well, wait, what's the question you're trying to ask? What is the decision? What's the minimal data? How is this going to make it better? Because I know this is cool, but it's kind of, for us as an agency, it's like, kind of hard and expensive, not just us, but it's just like for the government, it's like kind of hard and expensive to do all that kind of stuff. So it takes a lot of work and I know it's going to be fun and cool, but like, what about over here? Like, you know, what kind of things can we work on? Yeah. Yeah. So we have a question online, if I can interrupt. Oh, sorry. Sure. Um, and it goes back to the question about open data. Mm -hmm. um, and in particular, follow on to that uh, comment on the impact of open data and the need for higher quality data. Do you struggle with acquiring, acquiring higher quality data and what can be done to improve the data quality? Yeah, so that good question. That's a really good one. Um, so struggling with the quality of the data that we've got coming in. Um, I know it's like struggling would be a hard, hard, I don't want to use that language, but it's word. It's one that we really look at. It's like for new data sources that are coming available, regardless of where they are, is making sure that they have the provenance that they need, that they have the structuring and the labeling things that they need. Uh, we have a, a I think we call it the commercial data office which I think looks at different data sources that we have, uh, which is public or paired with our, we call it, I think our GeoInt Assurance Office, which kind of is like a formal infaction or, or just instantiation of what I just described of like, what's the provenance of this data? Where did it come from? And things like that. Um, those are very key, strong efforts of what we have. Because one of the things that we really look at is for any new data source that we have coming in, how does it compare relative to what we've got right now? How will it potentially impact the decision making and trade craft of folks that we have right now? How do we catalog and log that? And how do we illuminate that or share that with decision makers who are, you know, making some high stakes decision just because of some great data? Well, or some new data that's from available from open. Well, what really do we know about that? Right. And how do we trace that and make that publicly available um, publicly in the sense to our analysts, to our workforce, to guide their decision making. Um, and then what I always love to do is get the feedback from them. Like, how does this, you know, sniff test like, how does this compare with what you think it should be, right? And building those relationships and feedback loops with ideally the source of the data themselves. So even going back to commercial providers as much as we can, you know, and other sources and say, hey, well, you know, we saw it this way or we saw that is building that loop. In. Let's take one more question. Sure. AJ, you got a question? Thanks uh, for the presentation, Andrew. Really enjoyed it. Uh, we had a, a conversation yesterday on skill sets and career paths for geospatial and data scientists. And I, I thought it was interesting that you said that the majority of your team is from outside of the Intel community. Yeah. And I believe you said that your team goes out in teams of four, sits with analysts and sees how data can help, how they can help. Do you think in that process, the data core people became more like analysts or the analysts became more like data scientists? They're a, Who went native? One of the, okay. Um, <laughs> anthropological term. Um, that's a really good question. I don't know. Um, I would say, again, it's anecdotal, anecdotal data, you know, kind of thing. Um, one of the models we have, like, with this team is by bringing folks in from other places. Because we literally had people who were, like, high gun, amazing data scientists in the ad industry in Manhattan who are like, wait, what are you guys doing? Like, that sounds awesome. Like, that's an adventure. I'll come join you and do those sorts of things. Um, who are now doing, like, amazing work I wish I could talk about. But it's just, like, super cool focused stuff. And you kind of go, like, who do they learn and where do they go? Well, the model that we have with the data core and rolling it forward is we bring those folks from outside and from industry, get that paired process, that experience with other folks. And then ideally at a certain point, they're like, you know what? I don't want to go back. I want to stay with this team. Like I, I jokingly, or you know, I use the reference of the team who's focused on what's going on with pickup trucking. All right. Okay. So I'd be like the West Africa group or something. And instead it's taking those folks who have developed this skill and have this understanding and network with the analysts who are there and then become part of that team. You know, and really it's like, do they become an analyst? Maybe they may become the data savvy analyst there who's training and educating. And the way that we kind of look at it is I use the network contagion model, but it's much more of like a hub and spoke kind of setup. It's going, it's like, cool, you've been on this team for a while. You've bounced around on this data core team. You've bounced around and solved problems in these different sorts of spaces. What are you interested in? 
And they were like, you know what? I'm really interested in building or working with this team over here. And you said, great. Okay, boom, pluck them over there and put them on that team to become more of an analyst, right? Or just be, build out their analyst skill set. So take all that, like I said, advertising and data background with the analyst data background, some interesting stuff you can do, put them together over here on that team and spread and grow. So looking at very much like thinking of the team as like an organic, like biological system, you want the flow of people coming back and forth. So you have the people going out, but then also too, as we have examples of, we have analysts who are ones who are like brave enough to raise their hand and say like, what is this team? How can they help me? And things like that. And then all of a sudden they realize they're like, they love metadata. That's what they love to do. You know, they were an analyst, but they were always kind of nerding out and they didn't feel like they were in their club and no one loved them or anything like that. And you're like, great. So like, come over here and be, well, we have data stewards, which like, if you love metadata, this is the ultimate job for you. You know, it's just like, come and do that. So that's happening as well, which I think is great because what it is then is like, there's someone who has been an analyst for like four years or seven years or whatever it is, and just gets that like visceral, like how hard it is and what that job is like. And now they're on this data team and they're the one who's like the expert or the more informed person than others. So that's really the model is getting that flow of folks in and out of the, the team itself, both ways. Yeah, so I, I, I kind of answered your question, kind of answered a different question, but hopefully I answered that and that we want that flow of folks to get both of those skill sets. Yeah. Cool. Cool, very okay. good. Looks like Andy. All right, thank you. And let's take a five or 10 minute break and get the panel set up for that portion. Thanks. No, I've seen you maybe at GEOAN or something. Uh, maybe? I've actually I was like, never been to GEO, but I've been yeah. to NGA. Like, or I've seen you in the atrium or something. I mean, so I, I was like, at, I was, at Esri. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, like yeah, when you said that at the so table, I was like, I know you from somewhere. Yeah, I mean, I, I, okay. work, I run our station now since the new project. Cool. Okay. And I'm just like, it was just super. I try to come once a year. Let me just stop the recording. I'm just saying. You know, I never.